Our bandit has a better repair out rate than London. Isn't that about 72 percent or something? Allegedly, so assuming you know the publican doesn't come along, and keep emptying it every night, like in certain areas of the UK, Vince. Wink, wink. Some of those cunts should be in prison. I mean, most of them probably were. Then they get out and start a bar, don't they? So, right. My guests for this one We've got Vince again. By the way, piece of trivia. Hails from Richard's favourite city he's ever lived in, Newcastle, United Kingdom. <laughs> I do, That's Vince. mental. I know, isn't it? As, as a lifelong, you know, born, raised here, um, nah, <laughs> just nah. <laughs> I know. That's your fucking reach, isn't it? And then our other guest for this one is going to be Mix. Now, when I say he was most recently one of the main coaches in Cloud9, give him a break, give him a chance. <laughs> listen, listen. He wasn't shooting the guns, and that was a lot of the problem in some of those games. I actually have always said this. It wasn't just because of Henry G. Just qualitatively looking at a lot of those games, it don't matter how many close games that that fucking team play. Like, I'm not going to say, like, and if they didn't win some of them, I'm just, I think it's a miracle they were that close. Like, you go look at the <laughs> roster, that isn't a fucking, like, Gambit roster, Navi roster, Face Clan roster. Like, the, that's like half an NA team with some players that, like, used to be good a while ago in Europe or something. I don't know. Anyway, Mix, what is the t- You're with Nordavind now, right? Mm-hmm. Who was actually on that team? It's like a Norwegian team or something. Uh, it's actually like an international team at this point. Okay. So it's, it's a lot of like kind of like a uh, more experienced kind of like older. Who are the most famous players? Uh, Tenskis on it. Mertz. Okay. Murbit. HS. I'm sure you remember. And Super, oh yeah, sure. Who was on a who was on a game at youngsters before Hobbit came in? Ah, uh, oh yeah, he was the guy who got kicked. Yeah. Which yeah. actually, if people don't know, dude, this is how you know everyone who pretend because you know everyone does that thing where like when Gambit gets good, they're like, ah, I was following from here, just going all that. Half of them don't even mention that Hobbit wasn't on the team. And yeah. secondly, they also, this is how you know they didn't watch Gambit Youngsters. They also just assume that was just an obvious upgrade. Like, what are you on about? That guy was doing fucking sick. Like he actually looked like a banger in that team. I actually thought that was a scandal at first. I remember thinking, like, so the Gambit Org raises this whole team of youngsters that's beating everyone, and then they just take a guy out for the washed up guy from years ago. Like, this is fucked. I remember thinking that's like a bit of a brutal log move. What, what's is that guy like, actually like in your team? Like a, a stroke of like brute like luck because it was like the reason they had to remove him is because he couldn't get like a Russian visa or something to like boot camp. Oh, right. Because he's actually Estonian. So right. it's not even like it's not even like you're like, yeah, we need to upgrade this guy. It was just like, well shit, we can't boot camp this guy, so we need to get Hobbit in. Um Right. He's still I think in, at the moment <clears throat> on our team, he's still trying, I think, trying to like find his place again and trying to find his find his group. Because obviously the Gamma Youngsters team was literally the only team he's ever played on. Uh, the only group of guys, so it's okay. a bit different to go from like you know a team of like four other Russian dudes to playing with like you know two Danes, uh, an Estonian dude, uh, uh, a German who's IGLing for the first time. So um, that's like kind of been one of like my personal like uh, projects. Like by just got into the team is trying to figure out how to like you know get this guy back on, back on all firing all cylinders. And, and HS is from Estonia as well, right? Yeah. Dude, you know one of my pet peeves? This actually will lead into a topic here. Is when people who are plebs just go, hmm, those flags are the same. They should play on the same team. So you know people now would, if they heard that mix, they'll go, wait a minute. Rops, HS, and then the super guy, they're all three Estonian. What if you made an Estonian team? It's like, listen, think about it for a second. These motherfuckers escaped the bane pit of Estonia, where they would have been nobody, never had a pro career. And your move now is like, listen, you're all playing for different teams. You know, Rops in your case, maybe you're one of the best teams that plays in the world to get paid an enormous amount of money. Quit all that and just go and make a novelty team for my literal five minute gimmick like appeal i won't even watch the team if it's shit and then basically also it's only three fifths of the team just get two other players that have the same flag and uh have at it because you know by the way what i'm gonna lead into now is somehow hltv dreams are manifesting you know back in the day when space soldiers was around and then Wox oh, yes, was on yeah. other teams and every person was like why does it work it playing space soldiers probably doesn't want to make a hundred euros <laughs> yeah, that fucking are you out your mind like not again all you're doing is collecting flags what is this shit motherfucker anyway so basically they're going to do it now though apparently except are they because obviously Zantaris is still in big but bizarrely he's listed as like he might be in this new project I'd love to be his teammates like yeah, what? Uh, bro is there another person called Zantaris like are you kidding me so anyway the the story is they're going to maybe make the super team so the only three players everyone gives a fuck about is obviously Woxic Zantaris and Calix Zantaris and Calix obviously did play together and then the, the point was they'd never had all three of them together in a team. And everyone always wondered because they're all like straight fire players in theory, right? 
What do you actually think of even the premise of making a team like this? Like, would you actually watch this team? Would you be interested, Mix? I'd be interested in it just because I feel like, especially if they have like those group of players, they'd be really interesting to watch. Just because like I don't know who's like what actually IGL on that team. True. Like, I don't know how that how that would work. And it's like it's a bunch of players that like Santars and Woxic playing on like, you know, 10 sensitivity, just like zooming their mouses yes. around. Just like I'm really curious as to like what their play style would be and like how they would play and how that would work. Because I, I can't imagine they would be a very consistent team just True. based on the players they would have. But they would be a team that would be like really annoying to play, I imagine, and like annoying team to prep for and play. Okay. What do you think, Vince? I just don't I don't see why Zantaros would leave big to go across to to this kind of mixed team. I d I don't really see it as being a, a career move that's positive for him. I mean, you go back to the Space Soldiers days, for example, and you had players like Paz there that was definitely one major, I think, was their IGL for a while. Uh maybe these yeah. are guys that can get back into the fray again, but I just look at it and I question why Zantaros would do it. Like, yes, big are having a bit of a, a rough time of it, they're up and down. But to you for you to step into that team. You, you go from like a, a guaranteed good wage, good position, you're going to the tournaments, you're going to be doing well at most of them, to now a huge question mark over your career. And I just wonder if it's a backstep for him personally. I think for Voxic it makes sense, right? Because obviously Cloud9 didn't end the way he was hoping for. I, I still think that that was really unfortunate for him and the rest of the team. Obviously before that was Mouse Sports. Um, yes. So for him it would make sense. But for Zantara as a player of his stature, I don't think it does. I also have to say, like, the reason why people do tend to make fun of, like, fans that stack a team like this in, like, the dream HLTV lineup is, like, there are, there is a concept in teams of, like, resources and who can take what role. And, you know, there has to be, like, there can't be, like, insane overlap. There has to be, like, you know, some distinction between, like, what I want to do can't be what you want to do. Otherwise, only one of us might be able to do it at a time. Like, these sorts of teams, unfortunately, do tend to be, like, if I had to guess, Santaras and Kalex are probably the same player. So already it's, like... Well, who's going to not do what they would do? Yeah, I'm pretty sure like, even Immor is like a pretty similar player to them in terms right. of like his stats on HLTV are like 1.22 or something. They're getting him because it's like another like star Turkish player, right. like insane name or something. And let, let's so, be real, like that is a factor in CS. That like the interesting thing about CS is it's not really about stacking stars. It's about having like some stars and then you know players that fit around them and you make an awesome team, don't you? Like in fact, I think right now one of the best teams is G two, and they clearly don't have like five stars. Do they? they have nothing approaching that? But they take players that normally people would be like they're shit, but then they work around the stars well. So you know it all works out. So the problem I have with a team like this is. And first of all, it would be like the phase factor. They would never all frag out. So the dream that you're having, that they all just shoot everyone in the head, probably doesn't happen, I'm afraid. Like, a Counter-Strike isn't a game where you just play any spot. Like, you tend to play the spots that work for you, and you have the system that works for you, and you have the guy that space for you, or you create space for it. You know, there's a there's a logic to how it goes. And I have to say, it's rare that you ever get the teams that stack these teams that are even actually close to what you'd expect. Like, I always thought even the classic phase clan, the Carrigan one, I th that didn't even really work like you thought on paper. Like, basically, when they made that team, people were like, oh, my God, look, it's like rain all off my Guardian, Nico. What it ended up being was like Nico and Guardian have such distinct roles they can carry most of the time. And then Rain is now just the most overqualified entry fragger in the entire fucking world. And all off Meister is your support player. Like, listen, if that works, God bless. But like in that scenario, like sadly, the joke is obviously if you could have swapped all of Meister for Ziplix, you'd do it tomorrow, wouldn't you? If you could swap like fucking Rain for even at the time he wasn't even that good config or something, you'd have done it in a heartbeat. Like it would probably just make you a better team, no matter whether the player's better or not. What do you think on this mix? Because obviously some of the teams you've been, I mean, the Cloud9 team, on paper, that team didn't look that good, but it was having all these great matchups, it was creating scenarios where they could win against better players. What do you think about the team dynamic aspect? Yeah, like, I think even sometimes, like, like even, like, what I would have wanted uh, S attack to be, rather than, like, him having to come in and, like, he, might, he has to, like, try to be, like, the star player, right? Like, he's, like, the star rifle at first. Then he has, like, switched to the op roles, like, you know, S attack maybe even playing, like, the same role that he was in Astral, which was just, like, an insanely, like, overqualified role player. Sure. Um, you know, he was like, he did really good in like that Zipnix role, right? Because I think sometimes it's even harder to find someone that's going to play like that Zipnix role and actually do it well than it is to find like another like sick rifler that's just like, you know, has sick game, puts up decent stats. Um, yeah, like it's all about like chemistry, like finding people. Like for me, I think it's more about like you have like the roles, like you can have like different types of roles within a team, right? But you need people that are like going to actually fit into those and play within the system. And you need people that are going to like, there's always like, I mean, element of like natural chemistry between players, right? Yes. Um, it's like, you know, it's not something you can always predict. Like, Astralis like wanted to keep KRB and then like, okay, well, fuck, he left. So now we got to get yes. Magis. And then it just turns out the chemistry between everyone is just insane. And they go on to win yes. the three majors. And even the same thing kind of happened with Gambit, right? You know, they had to replace Supra, they bring in Hobbit. Oh, it turns out it was actually a really good fit. Suddenly our players just elevated to another level because everyone else is feeling like 10 times more comfortable around him. So it's like, 
it's a really hard thing to pin down. And like, yeah, you can't just stack like, you know, sick riflers and then I'll put them in the same role. It might like work at first within the honeymoon period. Um, but eventually you're going to like go down like a couple losses. Someone's going to start to feel uncomfortable. You might have to like try to change some things around. And it's something that I think especially can just like spiral out of control real quickly where you just start to lose like a real identity in the team. And it's just like, it just turns into like five players just like running around doing their own thing. Sure. What do you think, Vince? Because I've always found that activity probably the, the most fascinating part. It's almost like the ghost in the machine and a lot of Counter-Strike. It's like you actually can never know from the players on paper what the team will even be like when they play, right? Sometimes it works in a way you never expect. Sometimes it's just shit and like, you know, you're banging your head against a brick wall forever. No, I 100% agree with you. I, I think it's one of the biggest components that people often overlook when they come up with their dream teams is personalities have to mesh. Uh, there has to be balance. Um, you, you can't have five players that all want to do the same roles and frag out and be, you know, the, the Billy Big Dick of the team. You know, there's going to have to be players that take more of a back step and, and they support those. They facilitate those plays. They allow the the cold zeros to shine these kind of plays. Uh, if you think of like Taco back in the day. So, yeah, I think sure. this is a component of of not just uh, like teams, but also like broadcast in many aspects of life. If If you have personalities that distinctly do not get along with each other, they rub each other the wrong way. CS is such a mental based uh, esport, in my opinion. I think a lot of it comes down to your mentality, your positivity, how you are doing in, in, inside here. Um, and that's going to have impacts across the board and how you perform. So if you're playing with people that you either don't get along with or people that you don't mesh with, that is going to show in, in terms of raw stats and in terms of raw performances. So it's never as easy as just these five players are good, therefore they will be a good team. That's often not the case. I mean, think of how many times we've seen this in French Counter-Strike over the years. Teams yes. that on paper should have been god tier and always underperformed. So it's not. It can even crazy. be the case that it's not like any of the personalities are like toxic or anything. You know, like it's not like anyone's just like straight up toxic or like doesn't like each other. But like sometimes the, the personalities just don't really naturally mesh that well with each other. Exactly. Yeah, it's like even like when like I felt like when like the C nine team was being built, the Colossus team. It's like it's such a tough thing to do to build like a new team from scratch with like five brand new players that have like never played with each other. Because, like, the odds that, like, all those guys are going to get along super well and it's going to mesh, like, instantly is, like, super low. Like, I feel like when you're trying to build, like, a new team kind of like that, it's, like, you especially need to, like, focus, like, okay, yeah, maybe this, like, first iteration won't work out, but you need to find, like, you know, like, the core of the roster that, like, can move forward together that's, like, going to be really sick together. Yes, that's also the reason, I think, again, fans overlook that. It's the reason why, until you know it doesn't work anymore, you stick with cores. Like, it doesn't matter that, you know, one player's having a slight slump for these three months because the idea is if we can get him through it, like, look what we fucking have to build on. Like, we don't have to start from scratch and build it all the way up, do we? We already have, like, an understanding and all the rest of it. I always thought that was the real secret Astralis had, by the way. It wasn't just that they were all the best in their role all the time. It was that, like, they had that Vert's Pro factor where it's like, when this guy's not, like, if if Depru drops off for three months, Magus just frags the fuck out and from his role he carries the game. It's like, you can get through the hard times, you know, you can take everything that you've built and learned, but you can also sort of survive the up and down sort of the stock market swings as it were you don't you don't have to sell you got the diamond hands blah blah blah, blah. I've just tried looking on fucking twitter about crypto haven't i again whatever <laughs> listen i'm gonna work everything i can into this episode right here's another topic we can move to i alluded to it earlier but people are finally starting to notice you can't just look at the w or the l you have to actually look how did they play the game? Like, how close were they to winning the game? Were they actually within a chance of winning that? Was that a fluke map win? The team that looks the most like Cloud9, and this has got to be depressing if you are this team because they don't <laughs> have a team that's Cloud9 level like players. It's got to be FaZe Clan, right? Like, mix this team, it, I'm getting mad triggered flashbacks because it's the same shit every time it's three maps. Every time, you know, we lose a map 16-14. Every time it's like, oh, over time, we don't win those. So yeah, you can have the, like, this is mental, mate. Because, you know, everyone's using it of like, oh, Carrigan shit, you know, you've hyped him up too much. Like, you know, his twists the answer. Like, you know, they have an all the angle where they go on the player side of it. Like, I, I wanted to know, because you were obviously in the mix with Cloud9 having this happen, right? What do you think when a team's in that situation where essentially... Every single game's winnable, but they just lose them all in terms of the series. What do you what what do you think about the the phase angle from that one? It's like a really hard hump to get over, right? Because it's like your confidence is kind of shot. It's like it's sometimes it feels like almost mentally it's hard to like envision yourself actually like winning the game when you're like you keep losing like that. It's like you're like, holy shit, it's like winning these games against these teams is like super fucking difficult. It's like how do you even like get over this hump? It's like at the moment they have like I think Twist have been playing decently well. But even him, it's not like he's like at like superstar level, like but like fragging out every match. It feels like still like the roles are like a bit weird. Like it feels like Rain still isn't like hasn't been like the fully initiated, isn't like you know playing at like a decent form. Um, obviously, Cold is kind of still just like 
uh, middling rounds. Um, I mean, with Brokey, it's been like he's he's good, but I mean, he hasn't he's not really like, he hasn't really been like a star op or anything. I even felt like sure. he was pretty good, like in the old phase clan when he was kind of like playing a lot of like the anchor roles and like playing like a lot of the uh, the bitch roles essentially, which is something that I felt he was actually really good at. Um, so it feels like at the moment they don't really have like their stars settled out. It feels like Twist is obviously supposed to be one of the stars. Sure. And like he's been doing decently well, but it feels like Rain hasn't really stepped up to that. Like Brokey isn't really stepping up to that as an offer, and I kind of question if he ever will, and whether it's even more worth for him to kind of be just like take a step back and then try to get someone else. Um, but yeah, like at the moment, it's like they had kind of like a weird roster iteration. Obviously, in the last event, they kind of brought in Olaf. Yes, and he played decent. And I mean, uh, especially kind of like playing for a stand-in, but still, it's like Olaf isn't going to be like one of your stars, right? So it's like. If you have Kerrigan and Olaf, okay, well then your other three players need to be like consistently fragging, yes. you know, consistently copying off. And if Rain and Brokey aren't doing that, then it's like, is it still something like you can sort out and like it's going to get better over time, especially with Rain, who I feel like hasn't really been at that level in a bit. And you know, is Brokey going to be able to develop into an actual like star opera, or is it like you need to like figure out what the identity of the team is going to be like going forward? Okay. Because this is one of those scenarios, Vince, where I feel like people do let bias affect them. Like, if you don't like Carrigan, you're just going to say the team's failed, blah, blah, kick him, whatever. But the problem is, like, for example, I'm a big fan of Carrigan's career. But I have to say, when I look at the FaZe team, it reminds me of the Cloud9 team. Even as I would say the sentence, look, they're always in the game, they're so close, I would always say at the end, look, let's be real, it's a results business. If you don't get the results out of it, you pretty much have to blow the team up. And I'm sorry, people get fired. That's just going to be what's going to happen. Like, it's, it is, at the end of the day, it's not about coming close. You have to win the game. So I say, I actually have to say, I think this ties into the chemistry thing before. Like, I still think on paper they've got a pretty good team. I'm mm -hmm. looking at the results, they're pretty good, but it's like, I have to say, I'm starting to feel like I might just blow this whole thing up. You know, I might just say, like, bring another player or something. Where do you come down on this? I think I'm, I may be a lot more optimistic uh, than, than both of you. I, I think even though there are issues and Olaf coming in isn't exactly, you know, the music to the ears that FaZe fans may be hope for. You look at their performance against Na'Vi, second best team in the world, pretty much only getting beat by Gambit right now. Two of the maps went 16-14 to Na'Vi. They could have easily won that. That was in the, the Premier Spring Final, um, the, the quarterfinal, sorry. So you look at that performance. Olaf didn't exactly, you know set the world on fire, but I think you're not necessarily expecting him to be the the Olaf of old. If you come in here expecting like 2016, 17 Olaf, like you're in for a, a bad awakening. Um, I think the team still has a little bit to to navigate through. I think they still have a couple of more gears that they can shift through. And the, the interesting aspect for me is, even though I am actually a little bit more optimistic about Olaf in the team, if he does play more of a supportive role, I think I can maybe unlock some of these players and they can actually play off his experience. He's the kind of humble guy as well that won't let Ego affect his gameplay. He doesn't mind taking the worst roles. He understands his position right now on this team. I firmly believe that to be true. Um, and I think that can offer something to FaZe. That's something that Carrigan can really work with. I do agree, though, that when you look at players like Brokey, he hasn't quite had that consistency that you're hoping to see from him just yet. But maybe with some more experience of having an Olaf on the team, maybe that helps to unlock him. I, I would give them a little bit more time. I know they've had plenty of time, but Cold Zera has just pretty much dipped out the squad and Olaf just came in. So I'm, I'm a little bit more accepting i suppose a little bit more welcoming and kind of curious to see what happens in the future there's no doubt though if we have these kind of results in a month or two yes and if you get the opportunity to take someone like rops you, you snatch the opportunity sure. with hands, obviously mm -hmm. but if you don't have the rops if you don't have players of his caliber i don't think having a lot in the team is is the the worst case scenario i don't think it is the end of the world i think he's a player that you can definitely work with especially if you're carrigan yeah i don't even think it's like it's not necessarily like like we're just kind of like chemistry and timing right it's like i don't think if like you kicked rain right because you needed like another big rifler I, I don't think rain's career is over right i think it easily have like a resurgence like a different team like a new project something new sure. um like i i feel like they have like a potential like core three in terms of like kerrigan twists and then it's about like well okay who's like the other guy that you know you kind of like build around if you are going to like blow it up and in, in kind of like restructure for me it'd probably be like brokey uh but not as like an offer more like him playing more back to like kind of like the uh, kind of like a role player type role, you know, lurking, anchoring, stuff like that. And then trying to find like, okay, another like really sick aggressive rifle or finding like another like um, really sick like up and coming opera, you know, and then trying to like build around like kind of like those roles. But at the moment, it feels like kind of like a mess. In the right. The next topic is one where... For the last, I don't know how many of you, listen, I don't, I won't pretend I follow tier two, right? But I do sometimes actually watch the games if it is 
Smooye on Movie Movie Star Riders. Or this next one is one that I actually love to watch. She's one of my favourite players in CSGO. I sometimes do watch Tier 2 when Sinners play because I fucking love me some Oscar, mate. He is, no joke, one of my favourite players to watch. Like He's got such an aggressive style, amazing opera. And if people don't know, the only reason he's not a Tier 1 player, he did have sort of a dip at the end of Mouse, but it's basically just because... Now, I don't like to overstress this because Reddit takes it and runs away with it and makes a narrative you can never overcome. Like, he's just had some teammates who were like, he's a bit weird. Or like, you know, he's a 30-year-old man and we're like fucking 19. We can't relate or whatever. You know, there's angles that make a lot of sense, right? But I have to say, when he's on form, what a fucking sick player. And in this team at like tier two, mate, this guy just dominates. Like, he's just like the symbol of tier two, mate. It's ridiculous. Like, he actually looks like, to me, if there wasn't any of these storylines, aspects. Like if, if if he was 19 and he was doing this, mate, he'd be picked up tomorrow. He'd probably be in FaZe Clan or something. So, like, Mix, I want to know this. Like, do you ever watch any of the Tier 2 scene? Like, uh, I, what do you think about Oscar? What do you think... Uh, like, uh, pick on any of these you want. What do you think about players where... Because there's, there's a lot of big names are hoping this can happen. They were a great player in the past, but, you know, they've had the drop-off. People forget about them, especially if you're old, they say you're done, you know. And you're wondering, can they ever get the chance again? Do they get another break at the top tier, as it were? Yeah, like, um, I can't speak too much on Sinners, because obviously I'm not able to catch, like, a lot of the games between, like, our, our practice days and, like, prep. All I really get to watch is, like, some of the other teams that we're playing. Um, but as far as, like, Oscar, um, I've always, like, really liked Oscar, because I even remember, I think this was, uh, this must have been on, like, the old Cod9, like, the South African one, when we were boot camping in Europe once. I think Oscar was, like, on Sprout. And I just remember, we played, like, uh, we scrimmed, like, Sprout on Dust2 or something. And Oscar was just like super aggro, like fucking us on like Dust 2. Like T side, like he was just going up cat alone with like his op, just like killing us, just like having like so much impact. Just as like, you know, sometimes with, like some of these older operators, right? You might be thinking, okay, they're just really good, or, like, you know, they're holding their angles, they're playing like really smart. Sure. You know, they're they're doing like a lot of the smart things. But Oscar was like like really aggro, like having a ton of impact, which is like what I always like in an opera. I always like someone that's like not afraid to be aggressive. They're basing like a lot of the rounds around themselves. Um, it kind of helps the team flow really well, especially like on CT side. Um, so I've always like really, really enjoyed that. And also like, yeah, kind of speaking as to like, you know, um, the older players that are kind of hoping to have uh, a resurgence. I think in a lot of cases for like a lot of teams, um, and maybe even like a team like my my own, right? It's, like get, trying to like take a gamble almost on a guy like that can oftentimes be better than like trying to say, okay, who's like the newest like sick young player that we can pick up? Because you pick up like the newest sick young player, like if he works out for your team, He's probably poached within like three to four months on most True. of these orgs, right? And then like, but if you pick up like an Oscar or something, the odds of that guy's getting poached like within three to four months is, is a lot lower. Like a lot, a lot of the time those guys are going to be able to like stick around a lot more. They're not going to have like as many like top teams like trying to scramble after them and trying to find the newest like sick young prospects. So I think for a lot of teams, they could do really well at like, okay, let's look at like what some of these older players, some of these more experienced players that maybe like people feel are like falling off. You know, let's go through some of these guys and see can any of these guys like fit in our team? Do you do we think any of these guys could maybe have a resurgence? Because if they can, you know, one, they bring like a lot of experience obviously to the team. And if they do, like most likely they're sticking around a lot longer than like a younger player would. Yes. What do you think, Vince? Where are you coming up with this from? Well, great points there, honestly, Mick. I, I also think that if you want to use a another player as an example here, Hobbit, a, a guy sure. that everyone wrote off, you know, a, a guy that everyone thought was just basically washed and done comes back he just got blast mvp award beating out players like simple axel shiro uh so you you look at a player like him he's proof that just if you get past the age of 24 25 it doesn't mean your career is over you can have a resurgence you can go back work on yourself and and, and still you know play at the very top levels now obviously with oscar i think uh, hobbit's like 27 maybe and oscar's like 29 so he's a bit older, plus he's playing an AWP, which is typically a, a role where reaction speed is a bit more important. But if you position around that, you play aggressive, you can take the, the control of the round, like Mick was saying. And the thing that always stuck with me and Oscar, by the way, I casted him so many times back when he was playing like some mouse sports, etc., is he was one of the most aggressive AWPers on Mirage. And he used to do this thing all the time in B-Apps on T-side where he just pushed straight away and he'd AWP onto B-side. And very few AWPers would do this because it was so dangerous. You get peeped from car, you get flashed, you get naded out, you were done. He would do this all the time. And he landed that ridiculous flick shot onto the player jumping up from van. He did this every single round, it felt like. The guy just had incredible impact. And so I have actually caught quite a bit of this in his games. And it's great to see him, you know, still around. I think he's also acts as a bit of inspiration, you know, to players that maybe sure. are getting on a little bit. Uh, and they look at their age and they think, oh, I'm done. Well, no, Oscar suggests otherwise. I, I think the age... 
I feel like age itself is overplayed a little bit at the pro level. A lot of people assume once you hit like 25, your reaction speed goes down the toilet. That's not really how it works. I just think a lot of other life responsibilities and influences come in. If you want to have a family, uh, you want to you know, have a partner, whatever it is, you can't travel around the world as much anymore. Uh, obviously, your body does break down a little bit. You can't sit playing games all day um, or for eight plus hours without it affecting you more. But I think it's overplayed a little bit. And it's great for me to see the likes of Hobbit and you know, Oscar in particular, like really still shining and holding their own, albeit at tier two in Oscar's case. Yes. But I think if people gave him a chance and he really wanted it, I think he could still bang it tier one. Sure. Yeah, one thing about this, because as I said, it can lead into like, the more abstract general topic like you were saying there. Right now, we have this crazy group of players, and this just shows what the online era has done to the minds of people who watch CS. We've all just become sucked into the idea that it's just about being sick online today in this match, and that makes you the best AWPer. Can you imagine in 2018 me telling you this? Oh, this group of players are literally, nobody wants them in tier one. Some of them can't even get a team. Oscar, Guardian, and Kenny S. Like, you're having a fucking laugh, aren't you? Like, none of these players are good. None. Because here's the problem. I have a principle, which is when you're a great player, same as with the call, like, you never get rid of it till it's, like, definitely stopped. With a great player, you never, ever bury them. You never say they're done. They'll never come back until, like, there's so many factors. Like, it's just obvious they can't come back. Listen, if they had an injury, there's a good reason they might not be able to. If they literally, you know, had, I don't know, something, they had, like, mental problems or something, there's a reason that you might never be able to play again, you know, whatever it might. Unless there's something really, or unless they just literally are really shit at the game. That's obviously the most obvious one. If they like, eye test is absolutely terrible. The yeah. problem with these players is this. Nearly all of these cases that I've found out, like, in the case of Oscar, it is just something weird. Like, he doesn't want to be, like, a sort of full-time pro and go to every event. He sort of wants to play sometimes and be good, but then he also wants to, like, not have to do, like, the sort of hardcore boot camps. I mean, there's a lot of factors that basically make him sort of, like, an anachronism for the modern age. Like, that's just not, like, modern CS, mate. You can't really pick and choose that way. It's the reason why even people like Alex had problems when they were like, I don't want to go to all the events. It's like, mate, that limits you to, to a very small number of teams that can take you. But the other part, in terms of Guardian and Kenny S, because every fan now is going, why well, would you waste your time on them? They're all washed. And as you say, Mix, they would all tell you, no, 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 get Farling in, get Acor in. These guys are the shit. It's like they have literally, Guardian and Kenny S have forgotten more about being amazing Orpers than Acor and Farling may ever know. And what I mean by that is, even if today those are young players are better, the problem is, no joke, if the right circumstances happen in a year, the others could be the best in the world again. I mean, both those players have done it even. They've come out slumped and gone back to like top level Orping. So for me, the real factor... And it's why it's an interesting one with those two is that it's the same story as far as I can tell. Every time they have ever dropped off in the game, if you behind the scenes talk to them because they're mega open guys, they're not the people who have like, you know, some bullshit mental excuse or like, you know, some, ah, just having bad games. They'll just straight up tell you, look, I'm not motivated for CS right now. I have been playing for 10 years straight, you know, or like, you know, I need a break, but obviously I can't just not have any salary. So I'm just playing up my contract. Or the worst one is where they just say, and both of these motherfuckers have told me it. So I always told them, you tell me I'm going to put it public. They, all, they just tell you, look, I'm not playing the game much at the moment. I just play the scrims. I play the officials. You know, if I'm on form, I'm on form. If I'm not, I'm not. Now, if you do that and you're going against the guy who's 19 and he is playing like the fucking 80 hours a week, yeah, you're going to have a hard life, mate. Like at that point in time, he doesn't even have to actually be better than you. He's just going to be in way better consistent form. He's going to know all the angles. He's going to have done his home. You know what I mean? Like you're not giving yourself a chance there. So basically with those players, this is why I want to make this comparison. Oscar is what I want those players to do. Because here's the problem. I agree, Mix. Like if I have to make like the, the hard choice of like upper an FPL op or, or Kenny S., Listen, if I'm the guy who can reclaim Kenny S, yes, I've just won the fucking lottery there, haven't I? Like, yeah. that's it's way worth more than the FPL upper because he brings all the other intangibles and he could be as good. But the problem is this, right? I wouldn't want to stake my career. I mean, this happened, obviously, to my boy fucking Henry G. Listen, if the Woxic deal had worked out, that would have been, he'd have seemed like a genius. But because it didn't, it made him look like an idiot. It made him look like, what have you done that for? So my problem is this. Oscar went away and just started playing in tier three and tier two, worked his way back up, and now he's in such insane form except for the whole thing of do people want to play with him. Ah, oh, what does a GM take a gamble? It's not even a fucking gamble anymore, is it? He's, just, he's ready for the next level. Now, if Kenny S and Guardian didn't do, unfortunately, what they're doing, which is sit on a bench or sit just contactless and just go, 
available for any tier one teams. It's like, no one's picking you up. Like the last time they saw you, you sucked. What you need to do is this. You need to go. And if you're Kenny S, mate, join that double pony team. If you're Guardian, go and join some fucking team. Like could even be like a Sprout type team that would want you. You know, if I know he was standing in for Sinners at one point. Go join a team like that. Bang out. In which case you prove to me it's not motivation. You are playing the game. You've got some of your form back. Because then I think the Shrewd team, the Shrewd GM will make the move. And even better, even some of your ex-teammates that gave up on you. They might be in another team right now. Like, I tell you what, maybe fucking Carrigan looks down and goes, you know what? I agree, Mix. Maybe Brock is good, but he's not a god. Eh, Guardian's banging out a control in tier two. I know what I can do with Guardian. I've worked with him in the back. Let's bring him back up. Like, that can happen. I think that's a real possibility. I know not many people I, uh, are going to do it. You've got to have a bit of faith, but I think, I think that's a real path back for some of these guys. Yeah, I didn't realize how much I wanted to see Kenny S on phase until now. Because... <laughs> I really think because I don't actually, I actually don't know how it works with Kenny in like in terms of his contract and what he can play, um, but I don't know. I feel like that would actually be like something really sick to see is like Kenny S on phase playing with Kerrigan. Sure, um, I do think someone's gonna hit gold with Kenny S because that dude, when especially when he's motivated, yes, is just on another level. And obviously his motivation goes up and down. I think that's probably a large part. Um, obviously, like the online era when you're Kenny S and you've been playing CS for like you know ten years and you've been playing like countless LAN events for like. Well, as when he is in front of the stages and stuff like yes when you go on the online especially at that point when you're someone that's already like struggled with motivation and stuff in the past it's not really that surprising that he really struggled on g2 in the last few months so i, I really think someone someone surely will take a chance on kenny especially when lands start to come back and i think they're yes. gonna hit they're gonna hit the lottery this is gonna sound like a shit excuse right because any in fact any player who hears this will probably just write it down so they can use it themselves is not true but mm -hmm. kenny s i'm not joking he's always had some level of motivation issues because he started playing when he was so young it's all he ever did in his life he never sort of explored anything else and so he's always thought like you know if i can sort of, he's basically like the guy who could get a fucking a plus but he just gets like a b plus because it's like ah, i can fuck around a bit and get the yeah. b plus i'll just do that you know like i'll have time when like for example if the team's not that good i'm not gonna fucking go out and mental like simple i'll just chill and then if we get really good like we get another player maybe then i'll put my ass in gear and we try and win the major or something right so the problem he has as a player i have to say is he really is a player where no joke if you asked him what's the like i'll give you a great example you know at the end of 2019 when there was that big massive debacle when mouse spots played against astralis in like udens denmark and basically the crowd was just cheating for astralis so that they were, like calling out <laughs> boosts and all sorts of garbage because they wanted astralis to win right when the whole debate happened of like should players be in boost should we block off the sound? Kenny S said, this is what an honest, like, but naive guy this guy is. He said, well, the reason I wouldn't want it to be in a booth is just because, like, no joke, one of the reasons I play is to hear the crowd cheer when I play. Like, that sort of is, like, part of, like, that, that like, sort of, like, you know, like, musicians say, like, that addictive, like, energy you get from it. Mm -hmm. That's, like, yeah. one of the reasons he's still playing. So I have to say, it sounds like a shit excuse, but if you tell that guy, look, you're already playing online Couch Strike for one year, mate, that he's done. Like, there's, he, he's never going to get what he was feeding off in that scenario, yeah. you know? Like what what Kenny kind of reminds me of is is that natural gifted player that maybe cut too many corners, and I, I think there's maybe an element of it as, as well. Like what you're saying, it reminds me of that quote that hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Yes. Um. Now he's only 26 as well, by the way. So I mean, he, he's still got a bunch of years left in the tank. I absolutely agree. I think if someone can hit you know gold with him, then they've just cashed out massively. If he if he does get that hunger and that drive to come back. Um, someone like a double pony would be really interesting. And speaking of Guardian, uh, about I think like a week ago, he he stood in for Trident. I don't know if that's like a a permanent thing. That's with Seized and some of the uh, other right. players from the Russian region. Yeah. So I, I hope that's the beginning of his comeback trail. That would be really great to see a player of his his caliber and obviously our story. Yeah, some, uh, some good series from what I saw. Yeah, yeah, he has. He's been playing well down there. So it goes alongside the whole Oscar thing with working your way back up tier two showing that you still have it, showing that you've got that hunger and drive. Because that's another thing as well. If, if you're on a tier one team and you're in a really solid position and you had this guy that used to be incredible, then he dropped off the boil, you need to know that he has that hunger and that motivation again. Like if you if yes, he's going out not yes. getting paid as much money, he's playing against lower tier opposition. He's playing in like the the doldrums of the tier two tier three events that are grueling, like long days, long hours. And he's holding his own, and he seems like he's recaptured that hunger as a tier one. That that's music to your ears because you know you're not going to pick him up, and he's just going to sort of chill on the sidelines, not really pull his weight, and maybe once every six games actually have a decent performance. You know that you're getting a guardian that actually wants to get back to the top level again, and that's a terrifying prospect if you go against him, because he was one of the best that CS has ever seen. For sure. Actually, I thought we could transition this 
is it's a little bit of a sort of seamless segue, but another great opera that is having a few issues, but on a different relative level. It's got to be device in an IP, right? This move, listen, I remember thinking to myself, the one part I don't worry about this is device player. He's one of the most fucking consistent players of all time. He's a model professional. You know he puts in the hours. He's smart about how he plays. He's going to take his angles. He doesn't just, you know, he's not the guy actually like fucking Kenny S who just like runs to mid on Mirage eight times in a row. And it's like, well, I killed him seven, so I did my job. It's like, what about the game when they get you five times, Kenny? Like, he's not He's not that guy. He's the guy who's like, you game plan, you figure out the demos, you do your homework. So a guy like that, in theory, right, shouldn't ever really be able to have a slump. And I have to say if you go and look at like the last sort of like four or five series he's played in nip you look at some of the stats like this isn't the device i was seeing in astralis something's happened and i know richard brought up this angle so i want to like interject this into it and you can potentially go off this or in game stuff richard's point he's making is and that there's i think there's something to it is Device is right now in a whirlwind shitstorm of all the bad PR. Because not only, obviously, does every Astralis fan semi-hate him because they think he's betrayed them, but then, obviously, he's the Danish player, so any Nip fan who has to blame them for anything is going to go, where's well, Device playing well enough? And then, obviously, there's all that shit with the Anonymous thing, and then him stupidly saying, like, this is so hard for me to win bloody games and rob you of this victory. You, post. you know, like, every fucking step he could put wrong, he's, a rake goes in his face, doesn't it? It's, like, mental. So the mad thing is, if you think of his career... He, he's the classic person who obviously was someone who was a choker at one point in his career and admirably overcame it. But I tell you what, people forget this. He played in the same fucking core his entire career. He actually never had that idea of like, this is the thing people never give people like Nico credit for. Nico basically spent his whole life on the road in teams playing in second language English with random mixes of players and still put up the numbers of the great players of all time. Like, that's actually fucking God to him, mate. That's some like Jose Mourinho. I just go to every team and they get good level shit. Like, you're not supposed to be able to do that. So I think you look at this guy and it's like, I, I start to get worried for him, mate, because I thought, you know, he'll turn it around. He'll, he'll course correct. But like, pressure, obviously, in the past has been an issue for him. But then he at least had the comfort of being in a team, grow together, overcome shit. Like, it feels like right now, shit's rough. What do you think of this, Vince? It's obviously a player you've watched many, many times. What do you think of the whole situation with him? Because it was supposed to be like Nip hyped it. Like, this is going to be the savior of our team. You know, we'll go to the top. You know, I'm really glad that you mentioned the the aspect of him being in the same core because I think with the, the whole choking aspect that, that obviously a lot of people would have forgot about now back in like the TSM days, et cetera, uh, it, it was the, the team themselves that came together. And I feel like that camaraderie, that kinship that you build with the other four players in the roster, or at least the core of the roster, is something that will always keep going forward with you. Like that'll always be, you know, if you're having an off game, you can look to your side and you see a player next to you that you know is going to perform and that's going to give you yes. more confidence and spur you on. Can he do that with Nip? Like you do have players like Rez there that have been playing really well. But I don't think it's the same level and the same caliber. Plus the fact, one of the reasons he was always criminally underrated for me and never given his proper due and, and props is because he was playing against, sorry, he was playing with some of the best players that have braced Counter-Strike in their particular sure. roles. Glaive, Dupree, these kind of guys. So now you're going from that where everyone pulled their weight. Sometimes the vice would carry, but then you'd have games where even Glaive did or Magus yes. or Dupree to a Nip team where the pressure is absolutely on his shoulders. Like you maybe get Rez step up now and again for a huge performance. Hell, even players like Hampus have been doing solid work, but it, it now has to be more top heavy with him carrying. And on top of everything else, this feels like just so many, uh, it's like death by a thousand paper cuts sort of mentality here where he's got so much going on, this cauldron, this vortex of negativity that's surrounding him. Of course, it's going to impact his gameplay. He's a human being at the end of the day that has to you know, wake up and deal with vitriol and hatred on a daily basis now. That's going to impact your performance on the server. And the sad part is that's part of the vicious cycle because then that feeds into the negativity that you're getting and that makes yes. you play worse, which feeds into it. So <laughs> I do feel really bad for him right now. I've got to be honest with you. I think he's in a really awkward position. Thoughts, Mix? Um, I don't know. I think, like, honestly, my honest opinion is that I think in a few months' time, like, I think the Vice will be, like, like, obviously, I don't know, like, if he'll go back to playing, like, number three, you know, top few player in the world level, uh, like, consistently on an IP. Um, just depending on like how the system goes and how everything like that is going, um, but I do believe that like device eventually is gonna like find his groove again. He's gonna be like playing within like the um, you know, playing like within like the level that we know that device will play. And I think, but I think that also like, really counts on NIP kind of like figuring their shit out because it's like at the moment it's like there's like device, there's Res, there's Hampus. That's like a solid core three. Um, you know, Res has like been playing a lot better than he was like last year. Hampus is someone that I think is really good. And like he's pretty similar to Glaive. Like, um, not in terms of like I don't know how he calls, obviously, but in terms of like the map control that he takes and how aggressive right. he is and like the place yes. that he makes, stuff like that. 
Um, so for me, it's like they have this like kind of like revolving door of a fifth at the moment between yes. like ZTR, you know, the academy players. Plopsky isn't really playing that well. So I kind of like the comparison I make in my head is that like device, like NIP kind of has like the, the glaive and like the Dupree figured out and like Res and Hampus. But he doesn't have like the Zipnix and the Magis that he can like fall back right. on and rely on like his anchors and stuff. It feels like those two things are like kind of not figured out yet. You know, one of them is the revolving door. The other one, Plopsky's like always been a pretty good talent, but is like really struggling in this team. So I think it'll also count on NIP figuring that out because I don't think Device is someone like a Nico that's just going to be like fragging out no matter what the team. Yes, like you said, like he's been playing within the same like insane core for like the last like what six years or something. So it's going to be definitely an adjustment period to get that figured out and get comfortable with that. And it's also up to the team to make sure that they're building the right team around them. You know, that's actually one of the areas where I do feel like, unfortunately, that, that trio of players who just have that special quality, it's simple Zebu and Nico, right? Where, as you say, you can basically put any four humans with a warm pulse in the chairs <laughs> and they just do the same shit every game. Like, somehow they don't get affected by their teammates. I don't really understand it myself. The problem is it's skewed what fans think is you should expect from a player. You can take a lot of amazing players in Couch Like I'm talking those players that are going to be in the top 10 each year. And if you just randomly change the fifth player on the team... You have no idea what impact that could have, what ripple effect that could go off across the whole team. Especially, by the way, if you tie it to the device case, if I had to guess when someone chokes and they have problems when they can't perform, part of it is like you're saying, the rest of the team might have to evolve. Now we might have to know there's a safety net. You know what? If they don't perform, it's not the end of the world. This guy can, that might free you up a little bit to do it. Also, there's the whole factor of you thinking to yourself, like basically, let me think how you describe this. Threw myself off with that safety net analogy there. Let me think. Oh, that's it. What I was going to say was, if you're someone who choked, one of the first things I would try and do if I'm your IGL or coach is, let's make this guy as comfortable as possible. Let's remove every... So if you're an AWPA, for example, I'll tell you a classic thing that used to happen back in the 1.6. If you ever had a sick AWPA, but they're one of those ones that's mega paranoid that they're getting flanked all the time, you literally give them a bodyguard. You have like a lurker slash support player who always plays behind them. And they know that guy always watches the angles. He always makes sure someone couldn't have snuck past and got to my side. Because then they literally can just watch their angle they never have to do that shit where it's like i'm watching like down mid on mirage and the guy can step out a shot and shoot me in the side of the head i never have that like paranoia i just watch my angle if you're changing fifth all the time you don't have any idea on god's green earth what the players might do or what the knock-on effect is etc so yeah i do think that's an overlooked aspect because i don't care that simple zero and eco can do this like they yeah by the way extra props to them not not this to the people who can't do that there's a lot of great players would struggle if you change the fifth player in my opinion yeah, and you know, I think it also goes back, Duncan, to the point that we raised nearly at the start of the show as well, when it comes to personalities and balance again, right? If you, if you have a fifth that's constantly revolving, you don't know the personality, you don't know how they'll mesh with the other players, will it knock device off kilter? Will it affect his gameplay in any way? Kind of what you're just talking about there with positioning on the server, but also out of the server stuff as well. Like it it can all have impacts. And so if he's already unsettled in, in a myriad of other ways, whether it be like social media or his own performances, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, just keep, take out your comfort zone a little bit more. I think in, in uh, Astralis being so comfortable for so long and knowing each other so well, that really afforded him to fully focus on his own gameplay and less so on what his teammates were doing. And I think you're seeing a bit of a byproduct. I do agree with what Mick said, though. I, I feel like if if Nip can just slightly iron over a couple of these these uh, issues, he absolutely can get back into some solid form within the next few, few months. I, d I don't think it's a case of pushing like you know the self destruct button or the alarm bells just sure. yet. But the, it's definitely like you can hear them in the distance, right? Like there's there's enough little worries and concerns at the moment. By the way, one point that you made as well that I also think is a banging point is it's also about the idea when you're in a core that you've been through the fire, like you know what that guy's made of. Like I've always thought, this is one thing that's really misunderstood. I'm going to explain it to fans now. From the outside... When we look at a team, think of classic examples, like when Smiths was still on G2 as an active player, right? We look from the outside, like harsh fans who just look at the numbers and the raw test, and we go, listen, the guy's washed, get rid of him, right? He shouldn't be in the team anymore. But I know why people like Shocks keep him in the team. Because what they do in their brain is, when they think of Smiths, 
all these images flash up in their brain when I was winning championships with him, when he was a really good support player, when he was flashing for me, when he was a great teammate. They think of rounds that he's won that were unexpected. Oh, you had a way better tournament than people said then, and she was open well. And all these good memories flash forwards because those are the positive associations, and they think he can do it again. Now, they might be wrong at this point in time. Maybe now he is washed, and now he's not going to do that anymore. But that's why I always said, like, people who are who haven't played won't realise the impact, like, certain key moments will have. Like, if a guy won, like, some god-tier 1v3 in an impossible scenario in, like, a major quarterfinal that... You're going to give that guy months and months extra going forward. He might play like shit for two months after that, but in your brain, you're always going to think, something tells me this guy can do it. Like, I believe he can make it. The other thing as well is this, and by the way, he obviously doesn't have those people on NIP yet. The one other thing I would say is this. This is where PR can bite you in the ass because people can use your words against you. You know, when he joined the team, listen, what Device should have just said is this. Listen, I've got health issues. I already have issues playing at tier one. I want to have a more comfortable lifestyle. I live in Stockholm right now. I don't want to travel to Denmark all the time. My girlfriend lives here. I'm going to maybe have a family here. I speak the language. There's a million reasons to be here. There's actually not as many reasons to be elsewhere. Who knows what Astralis is doing? So for now, in the online period, I'm going to take a slight step back. I'm going to help Nip build their project up. And I hope one day we can be at that level. That would be like the perfect answer, right? Instead, he came with all these myriad angles. And one of them, right, sounded sexy as fuck but it's making him look stupid now he Thought said angle. well of course I've never been the number one player so I, you know I've never had that status I want you know I want a chance to maybe be number one so what you're telling me is you willingly of your own volition stepped into the simple nightmare simulator <laughs> are you out of your mother fucking mind are you aware like this is why I said, because fans used to always say that to me. When I used to compare Nico to Gold Zero mix, they used to always go like this. You don't understand the game, Thorin. Cold Zero players with Fallen, Fur, top players. So as a result, there's not as many frags to go around. Nico <laughs> plays with bad players. So it's easier to drop 40. And I always used to say, you are a wet, it's basically the opposite. Like it's real. Like if you've ever played a face it game, everyone knows, everyone, I'm an Elo hell. Well, just carry the game then, bro. Drop 50. You can't because you're 1v4 all the time. You have no cover. Everyone's just shooting you. You, have, they, you know, they haven't done any damage to the fucking opponent. Can't. It's like, it's actually way harder. So I've always thought, be careful what you wish for. Because, mate, I would never want to be in a simple scenario. I'm pretty sure simple doesn't want to on some level. <laughs> There's, like, plenty yeah. of games where I've seen the Vice, like, on a, even, like, on Astralis, where, like, the Vice will just randomly go, like, 5 and 20 in a match, right? Like, I feel like this happened, like, once every, like, three months or something. But, like, you know, his teammates on Astralis are good enough that, like, they can still win the game, generally, yes. you know? between like all the others but like if device goes like five and 20 on nip right now there's no chance like they're not winning yes. that match so it's like he he doesn't know like what hampus is made of especially like on land he's never played on land with these people like on stage he doesn't know like when the pressure's on like how's hampus gonna play how is res gonna like step up to the occasion you know his other two teammates that you know aren't really settled at the moment so it's yeah it's, it's a tough thing to get used to it's it's definitely like a tough mindset to go from okay i can go like five and 20 like there's a good chance we can still win the match versus like if I don't perform, we literally can't win. Dude, when Simple went, was going, like, I said, when I was doing my desk, they looked up the stats while I was talking about, like, you know, Navi against Gambit. And they were like, well, thing is, though, Simple's only averaging a 1.2 rating against Gambit. They do shut him down. It's like, motherfucker, that would be, like, the best series ever for the rest of the play. What are you talking about? Like, what? Th listen, by definition, you haven't shut down a player averaging 1.2 rating against you. That probably implies you can't shut him down, really, can you? <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> the, the, the whole thing with the device situation as well is like i don't know if nip got in his ear on wanting to say something like that you know for the, the to PR pump him up or whatever yeah maybe maybe to just get some wine games in but like there's nothing wrong with with him wanting to to be there with his girlfriend and not travel as sure. much especially if his health is concerned like it's no no big deal to take a step back in your career if it's for the greater good and for the bigger picture i don't think anyone would have held that against him actually a lot of people would have really respected him for taking that decision and coming out and saying it so i can't help but feel that either he shot himself in the foot or nip have because expectations now are even higher because guess what if you come out and say never been the first top player in the world want to be top player in the world and then you're just getting banged out time after time now people can quote that against you now people are saying, well, you're expected to be the best team in the world, the best player in the world, and you're be getting beat by tier two teams. You know, you're constantly losing 2-0 to these teams that you should on paper be beating. That just feeds into all of the negativity that he's dealing with. It's such a strange own goal to me. I don't understand it. Yeah, like, the thing is also is that, like, even if, like, you don't, like, come in and you don't say, like, okay, 
like if the vice didn't come in and didn't like sorry i'm trying to like reverse my words sorry. if he didn't come in and say um i want to be the number one player in the world or like i want to be like you know win majors with nip right it's not going to take away from if they actually do it like the device yeah, sure. actually became the number one player of nip and he never said that like yeah that's what i'm going to do like it's still epic as fuck to do or if he goes and wins a major of nip like that's still like super like that's still super epic like that's still going to be like you know additional mega points to his legacy like that's going to be like super yeah it's just going to be like super amazing Oh, of course. Yeah. Right. I'm going to go and do the other. Sure. Probably, by the way, shouldn't, I wouldn't attempt to go for him if I were you. I always told people that, you know, there's always, there's always, always analysts, right? We all know Dust did it once. There was always analysts and people in talent who were like trying to be like me. And I was like, motherfucker, I can barely get, pull it off. Why are you trying? That's like if I was like the best fucking, like, you know, like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what do you call it when they walk along like the wire or whatever and they fucking have the bar right. to hold them? Tightrope there. If I was the best tightrope walker in the world and even I fell off two times and almost died, would you be like, I think I'm going to give that a go. Like, yeah, what are you talking about? I can barely do it. So let me almost pull off being Thorin and you just stick in your lane. Like you just, you just do whatever you do. So, okay, we're back. Now here's a, here's a topic I thought we could talk about. And it's a bit of a bummer because I have to say, if you know the way shit went last year, where it would go like this, oh, this LAN event's four months away, so we won't announce yet that it's cancelled, the major, <laughs> and we'll wait, and we'll wait, and we'll wait, and nothing's changing, and we'll wait, if anything, things are getting worse, we'll wait, and then a month before, we regret to announce the major will not be happening, everyone just played 400 hours of Counter-Strike for nothing, blah, blah, blah. Well, obviously, if you're not following the news outside of CSGO, I've got some bad news for you guys. Because last year, Sweden was one of the countries that had the least amount of lockdown type restrictions. This year, they tried to put the two Valve big tournaments there. They were going to have the international there, I think, pretty soon. And they were going to have the CSGO major, obviously, like, you know, four months now or three months from now or something. Well, the bad news is they've just announced that the international isn't going to be taking place in Sweden. And for a very weird reason, which is just that Sweden won't actually acknowledge work visas as legitimate for CSGO players, because essentially they're not acknowledging like esports as a sport. It's like, it's a weird, it's not even anything to do with any of the lockdowns. It's just it's like a weird angle that they're just sort of saying <laughs> it isn't like being a footballer, it isn't like being what, even a snooker player, you know, whatever fucking sport. Yeah, they didn't recognize it as like an elite sporting event. Yes. Like and so to them, it's not necessary. You need to come basically. Yeah. Now, the problem with that is if they're doing that now for the international, remember, Valve, if anything, will probably put more weight behind trying to get some of that through. The idea we're going to have the CSGO major when it's not about the lockdown, it's just about this status, that that makes me feel like, I don't want to be the bringer of bad news, but it makes me start to feel like ominous feelings that like we're just going to wait two months and I'm going to find out there's no CSGO major. What do you think on this, Vince? Because obviously, listen, I'm, like all talent, no matter what people think, you all want to work the major, you all want the major to come back, if Lance come back, I always said the dream would be it, the major comes back, it's a banger, we, you know, we kind of like can race the months before... Do you, do you have a bad feel about this? What do you think? It, what would happen? I know it's a horrible thought. What would happen if the major just doesn't take place? I, I'm I'm genuinely concerned. Uh, I've got to admit, once this news came out, I was I was pretty feeling pretty down about it because I, I've said before that I I think I'm more optimistic in the sense of not quite saying you know CS is done or the doomsayer or any of that. Sure, but a lot of my optimism was based off the idea right. PGL's doing the major. It's going to be incredible. They're going to nail it. If there's no major, then that that hope wanes for me, you know. And for me, the major had to be beyond reproach. It had to it had to be pristine. It had to be smooth as butter. We've already had issues with some of the RMR tournaments. We've already had problems that have that have arisen. And now this comes around the corner. I also feel terrible for the fans that were planning on taking holidays out and going across there. Like this now puts doubt in their mind as well. You know, like they booked time off work or whatever. And now suddenly they're not sure what's happening. With it. Um, it's just an it's it's a nightmare, honestly. And I think if the major doesn't go ahead, I, I hate to say it, but I fear the worst for CS's future at this stage. Like I think this major is so important for Counter Strike. What do you think, Mix? Yeah. I'm probably a bit more maybe like naively so optimistic, just in terms of like it seems like Cologne is actually going to be able to go ahead uh, with Studio Land. It seems like Blast maybe later in the year will actually be able to do something in like Copenhagen. Um, so I'm kind of like just keeping my eye on to see like what happens with TI first because I obviously like the issue is that they can't host it in Sweden, so they're trying to find like a different oh you, you mean they, maybe they just move the major to another country basically yeah 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 so I right. feel like I feel like something that may likely will happen is that like Valve will like move TI to somewhere and then likely wherever they move TI like 
you know, maybe the major that's a good take point. place in the yeah. same location. You know, maybe they're like they're trying to work out a two for one type thing, making sure that you can do both events. Because I do think, obviously, like I said, I'm a, maybe I'm a bit naive, but I do think Valve probably does prioritize a bit, like actually getting a major done this year, like they did with uh, getting sure. TI done this year. Because um, I think they at least care about that, like a little bit. Um, <laughs> In terms of oh, the obvious the joke would be yeah. that, like, what you said is perfectly logical. If you yeah. arrange to play the international, the next thing yeah. you'd do is just say, bring the CSGO major here. The problem yeah. is, no involved, it'd be more like, yes, it's well. finally, we got the international down. This is brilliant. And then one guy would just go, what about CSGO? It's like, what? Counter Strike. <laughs> what, that old game from like 20 years ago? What do you want about? And like, well, it has to have its mate. That's still running. It's making us billions. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's not Dota though, is it? Or <laughs> oh, sick fucking I don't know, fucking Windrunner, whatever. The, you know, that, that shit it's gonna be. No, it's gonna be announced. But like TI is gonna get moved. Like it's supposed to happen. Like yes. what next month or something? So, like that, TI yeah. will get moved, and then like two weeks after TI, they're gonna announce that the CS:GO major is just canceled and they can't move it anywhere. At <laughs> all, <Probably not laughs> <at laughs> it's just gonna be something like that. Just like fucking hell, like whatever. The, see, my my concern is that. That that's all well and good, and I agree. It would logically make sense, but the major is exactly four months away, and if they delay this announcement until another two months, three months, is that giving people enough time? Yeah. Additionally, whereas Dota, it obviously has its own pitfalls against League of Legends. I feel like Dota is in a really healthy spot right now, for the most part. Sure, like you know, it's it's okay. I think CS is in a much more dire position than Dota is. If the international doesn't happen. It's, it's going to suck for Dota, don't get me wrong here, but I feel like this next major is super important because even if stuff like Cologne goes ahead, uh, if Blast continues to go ahead, there's already waning viewership for a myriad of reasons. I think sure. a lot of people will be way more hyped and way more amped up by the prospect of a major, the Pick'ems, mm -hmm. all of that revenue stream that comes with it, that if the major doesn't happen for whatever reason or if it's delayed and then you know last minute it's announced that it's going to happen in Denmark or somewhere else or like Europe somewhere, uh, that's going to impact who attends the event. That's going to impact a lot of travel restrictions. We don't also know how COVID's going to be faring. There's mutations all the time that come around the corner. One of them may very well, you know, throw things under the bus again. So this does concern me quite a bit. I, I, I've got to be honest. I was very optimistic and naively so, but this this definitely is like uh, along with the RMR thing as well. Uh, this just puts like a bad feeling in my stomach regarding the major and and kind of I think it tarnishes it a little bit. You know, it's it's not necessarily anyone's fault. I, I don't think that you can point the finger and blame anybody for this, but it doesn't change the fact that for me personally, and I know a lot of people from the UK that were planning on going across to the major, they've already reached out and said like I I don't think I can now because I don't know where it is. I don't know if it's still going to happen. I can't afford to take off yes. this time. Like it it screws up the fans. Yeah, I will say the fan angle is the part that everyone always forgets about, which is kind of fucking rich, isn't it? It seems like every fucking TO sucks off having a fan base. Like, oh my God, this crowd is incredible. The best fans in the world. And then the same people, as you say, they're the ones who carry the can if you cancel the event. Because here's the problem we all know, like since about fucking the last 25 years you can't refund plane tickets in most cases that's non-refundable it says that in all the small print so you lose the plane tickets listen if you're a normal person like where for me and Vince are from you haven't got the fucking money for another set of plane tickets you probably saved up from that from your job yeah sometimes you can get the hotel back if you pick the more expensive option that lets you cancel and you just give them like I don't know $50 or whatever the fuck yeah you can do that sometimes but yeah it's gonna fuck your whole thing and you probably book time off work like that's one area I feel like is mega underrated because that's mm. why I agree what I hated about about the major getting cancelled last year in Brazil was like you cancelled it so short before that like you would I'm sorry as a fan you would have been a fool to have had tickets and not booked your plane tickets in the hotel then you might then be the guy who has to stay in the worst hotel in town get the worst flight there so it's like you're not giving people a chance because I know that's one area actually where I do actually kind of Put it this way, I can go both sides from a talent perspective when I hear those stories that like, oh, this musician has a bad throat tonight, so, you know, he can't perform and he has to cancel the gig. Listen, I get it. You can destroy your voice if you go out and do that, you know, blah, blah, blah. The problem is if it was me, I'm not joking. You've seen me at events. I've never, ever, ever turned down a game. I've never, ever taken a game off when I was ill, something like that, because my opinion is show must go on. And in that scenario, I don't want my fan that, you know, what? you know, those Nota fans where they travel from Europe to like fucking Orlando or fucking LA or fucking Dallas, they go all the way to that gig because they're following you around the world. 
and then you can't come on that night. You are fucked, that guy. I'm sorry. I know you might think, oh, that is your fan. That is the guy you were doing the gig for in some sense, right? So I'm really torn on that one because I do feel like, yeah, none of us want the event to be cancelled. You want to hope, like, you know, that the 11th hour, a miracle happens and it gets saved. But I do feel like there's eventually, like, there's a window of responsibility. And for me, it's probably two months before. When it hits two months before, just tell people, look, at this, I'd even maybe tell people, maybe wait until that point to start booking them. If you, you know, like, there's a chance it cannot happen. And at that point in time, if it's not doing it, we'll agree to cancel it. If for some reason it comes on again, no harm, no foul. People can try and scramble. Maybe we do it. But like, I know it's a bad PR move, so no, t- no TO wants to do it. But I do think you have to be a bit responsible there. Just think about the people, especially, mate, we've got so many 16-year-old kids trying to get their dad to take them again. He's going to fucking, again, my family would just go, we're not doing this again. <laughs> of course. Be yeah, over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, at the end of the day, safety is the most important thing. So if if there's any doubts uh, as to whether the fans will be safe, then absolutely, you know, reschedule slash cancel it. I, I'm not opposed to that idea. For me, I think, as you say, they just have a responsibility to give people enough notice. That's the important part: is give people a chance to know what's happening. Um, please, Valve in particular, they have notoriously been very slow at relaying information and keeping in contact with the community. Let people know what is happening regarding this, a step-by-step basis as far as I'm concerned. If there's any doubts at all over whether the Stockholm Major will happen in Stockholm, it needs to be told as soon as possible, not a month beforehand. Um, that, that for me is just the most important aspect of this. But of course, it'll be a, a, a severe blow if the Major doesn't happen for whatever reason. One other thing I'll say as well about the major is this. I really agree that we need this major so fucking badly. Because I was one of the people, by the way, who always said, I don't even want to hear any talk about an online major. Like, I, I hate that for historical reasons. I don't want it to be an asterisk. And I even hate it for the team that wins. Like, oh, congrats, you were the best team on paper at the time, but fuck you, it doesn't count. Everyone yeah. else is a plastic ring and everyone else's is real. Like, no one wants that for you. And also, like, it already tilts me that there's like an Intel Grand Slam online. And, you know, like, even if Gambit wins it, look, they're brilliant now, but it ain't the same as winning the land one, is it? Like, we all know to win in stadium, when in legendary scenarios it's just a different vibe in it but i will say this being as when the major happens it will have been over two years since we had a major listen like everyone is blue balls to fuck it has to happen now and also there's an angle that's mad dark so i try not to bring it up because when i think about it, it bums me out actually everyone's gonna go ha simple never won a major and he's got motherfucker two years of his prime as when won the no majors Remember, so people already don't make it fair. Like, everyone who played the first half of CSGO was getting three majors a year. <laughs> now we get <laughs> one a year or none for two years. Like, what's this? You know, like that's already one of the factors. You know, no one's filtering by that. So I, I think it just has to happen. I, I'd even be up for the idea you're saying, Mix. Like, if there's a way to move it to another country, listen, it's still going to fuck people who booked and all that. But let's just have the major. Like, yeah. at this point in time, even if it's shit, even if people turn up and they're all rusty and it's not good, just having it will almost be like such a relief. It'll give everyone a moment they can be like, fuck. Like, the CS that you love is back. It's back again. And by the way, even if the level of player was shit, I guarantee you right now, everyone in CSGO, even like the legendary players that aren't there, everyone will be tweeting about it. It'll be like the fucking Euros now. It'll it'll just dominate conversation. It'll even do that shit that I've been waiting for the whole time, which is let's have a massive LAN, like a major, where everyone's going to say, you've got to watch this. And a bunch of kids who've only played Valorant are going to go... Oh, I might check that out. Isn't that? Yeah, that's gonna say the same. Yeah, there's like a whole influx of people yeah. that have just started with Valorant. Like, if there's like a CS major and people are hyped about it, people are talking about it. Like, they're probably gonna watch it because they're gonna understand what's happening. They're gonna give it a go because that was always the angle that's mad underrated about the Valorant thing. In my opinion, a lot of that is actually just fuck ups in our scene. It's things that have been mismanaged by Valve, CSPPA, American Orgs. It's actually a lot of factors I don't think are about the game entirely. The game is obviously clearly better than Valorant. It's a banging game still. In my opinion, one of the factors that is mad underrated is this. Monty is the one who actually came up with it on Flashpoint. He said, I actually think it could end up going the other way. And this was like when we didn't know how long the lockdown would last. He said, if we ever get to a normal scenario where they just compete as games against each other, if anything, isn't Valorant going to bring in loads of plebs who play league and casual games, and then they're going to learn the basics of a shooter tactical FPS. Something like the major is going to happen. They're going to tune in once and go, I'm in. Because it's already an easy game to watch. But if you if you have the fundamentals of Valorant, you're just going to go, this is the mm-hmm. shit. What, there's this game as well? Listen, at a minimum, you can start watching, even if you don't play it. And by the way, there's another thing. CSGO, you don't have to play it. You can watch it and get a pretty nice like yeah. feel for it, you know? It's pretty simple to watch. 
Oh, exactly. I, I totally agree with that. But also there's an element of it as well, uh, whether you like them or not, like the RMR stickers and capsules has such a, a huge amount of hype behind it. Like people put a lot of money sure. in, they're really into it. They want to get their favorite players stickers and put them on their guns. They want to get their favorite team's logos, these kinds of things. So it, even just that makes people load up CS and, and get closer to, to the game and wanting to play into it. And the fact that you can obviously watch it through the actual in-game client as well. You can watch the perspectives of the players. Like you can really get involved in this full switch. I absolutely uh, agree that the, the major has to happen um, for CS, and I think it will absolutely capture the minds of a lot of people that are uh, you know, stepping out from Valorant and other games as well. Like It's always the part of the year, or at least it used to be, where you know people were, were suddenly turned on to, to CS, even if it was just for a couple of weeks, you know, yes. that, that two-week period. And if you get 10, 15% of those people stick around, well, you've just had a, a big spike in, in the player base. That's huge. Like, these are the players that will stick around for the next 10, 15 years. By the way, you know, there's one of the mysteries no one really ever talks about, because it is bizarre, is in theory, you would think, like we all naively do, like, you know, first of all, we're everyone in the pro community, we all pretend Reddit just is all fans, and that anything they say, they're like, that's what they're all saying. It's like, there's like four people saying that, mate. Or, you know, like, it's, effectively, it's four versus the millions of people that actually play the game. Like, even the people on Reddit, the amount of subs that are on there that aren't commenting in each thread, there's like 400 comments, like, you know, 100,000 people, 800,000 people sub to it. It's even worse than that for the casual side of the game of CS because once you get to that level I'll fully say I don't know how the casual side works I don't know how a fan gets from playing matchmaking to watching a server uh, 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 like a pro match because one thing that was always a mystery to me is you can have a tournament with the exact same top 12 teams as the major a month after the major and doesn't matter even if it's ESL even if it's kind of it's here, the viewership will be like a third of the major. But then the major comes along and somehow just because it's called, and this is why I always wondered if it's Valve uh, sort of slacking. Is it because Valve push it in the client? Is it something, is it the sticker thing? Is it something else? Is it some word of mouth? Something takes the same tournament and does just like boost the viewership through the fucking roof and, and no one ever really has figured out what that is. Like, it's all, I don't know. Do you have any, do you have any speculations, boys? Can you figure out any angle as to what it could be? I think uh, a lot of it is it, that, that it's integrated into the client. So, like, you can basically, it'll be on the client somewhere of, you know, Navi versus Gambit, click here to watch. You can go through and watch the game, and it'll put you in the game, and you'll count towards one of the Go TV viewers that they use for the viewership records. Right. Um, but additionally, like, the capsules filter straight in the pickums as well as another huge part of the yes, major of where people basically pick which teams they think are going to progress it'll link you to the games there as well so there's this whole mini game aspect that's put into it and then obviously as you said you've got the hype component as well where everyone's tweeting about it, everyone's pushing it because it's already getting a lot of viewership it's front page of twitch it's the top you know game on twitch that's being viewed and people are like why is counter strike suddenly got a million viewers or whatever they tune in and so it's this word of mouth it's just the whole component added together i think valve actually does a really good job around the major of making sure there's as many eyeballs on Counter Strike as possible. I'll give them credit for that for sure. Yeah, fair play. Do you have any angles, Mix? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, essentially the same thing. Like the stickers, like it all kind of builds up. There's like the hype around it. Like it's people sure. are tweeting about it because it's like the most important event. This is like, you know, you win this event. This is the one like everyone remembers, right? So there's just like that extra element of like importance to it when you're watching it. You know, it does, it does at least for me feel different from like watching a, a normal, like, you know, big event or something. You know, it's like, yeah, this is like the legendary shit. This is what everyone remembers. Everyone knows how many majors you won. Everyone knows whether you yes. won a major or not. You know, you win a major like Gambit. You're in. You know, if Gambit just won like a random like ESL event in late 2017, who would still really remember that or really care? True. But because they won the major, you know, they're forever cemented into CS:GO legacy. So it's it's just a huge thing, and I think it just kind of gradually builds from that. By the way, because I'm just actually not that good at knowing how to like market to dem kids or whatever the fuck, I never even understood. And I missed so many years of this. I didn't know that if you're a content creator, you just make a video of your pickums. Like, it's like fucking crack to kids. Like, the viewership <laughs> would be through the roof. So I did it one year, right? And you won't believe this. The time I did it, like, because, you know, especially in those Swiss systems, like, there's a lot of fucking variances to who makes it out. I was getting like mad luck where I was doing like seven out of eight people get out and then like seven, six out of eight people get out. So the problem is this. Everyone was getting mad hyped and they were thinking I was like some sort of prophet like oh god he's cracked it he's getting all of them so then right everyone was piling in they were all just saying like he, he's got me already like the fucking silver thing oh my god I'm going with Thorin's picks all the way and I just remember thinking like you naive fool if it doesn't know <laughs> I've, I never win prediction contests mix I don't give a fuck so one of the things I was even doing this is mad like yeah, listen remember I'm not just like this is a metaphor for gambling here kids I'm not responsible for what you do if you copy me 
That's on your head. So sadly, right, even though all these kids were riding with me in that sense, I was just doing shit like, and I think G2 gets out. And then obviously in my head, it was like, because I just like existence from four years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and they're going, oh, he's picking G2. There must be a mad dark. I'm picking him as well. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, and I'm pretty sure at the end, like I'd done so many, right? Like you did get like, I think the gold one or whatever, but like whenever I did it, the final one, I did do some like mad picks like that. It definitely didn't work. Yeah. And they, obviously they didn't make the fucking top eight, did they? And so I just feel bad for any kid who kept the follow what I was doing. It's basically, I was like Elon Musk to their dodge coin there, basically. There's a reference to all the <laughs> consumer songs. That. I tanked the whole shit just for existence. That's right. But I do the same with predictions. I'll like pick a team just because I'd be happy to see them win. Of course. Yeah, yeah, sure. to, I'm like, yeah, that'd be sick. Yeah, double whammy. But that yeah. feeds into why the viewership so high because people get really invested in that stuff. Yeah. You know, they want to get their gold. They want to get their diamond. It, it becomes a really important part. People show off. You know, you get a little icon in game as well uh, next to your name if, you know, if you get the, the diamond pick or whatever. So some people do it every year. They get really into it. And I think it's an aspect that Valve have nailed, to be honest, when it comes to the major. There's so many aspects of that. And it's another reason why uh, from viewership, from from player base, from hype and everything else, like if the major doesn't happen, you miss all of that stuff. And that's that's going to be that's going to be crippling for Counter-Strike, I think. And I'll end on one last anecdote before I cut the show. And it's going to be incredibly self-indulgent, slightly funny, and just rude. So right in my fucking wheelhouse. Check, 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 check. Ding, ding, ding. Like, like, here's the thing. This is how fucked Valve software. It's not really. It's such an indulgent point. It's so pathetic. But I'm going to pretend it's all Valve's fault. Are you ready? You're never going to know where this anecdote's going. On that major, I think it was actually the Star Ladder major, the last one. And I was nailing all the Swiss systems. I was fucking killing the game. And then I didn't know, because I've never done those fucking pick before there's a, that weird feature where in like the playoffs you have to watch like a certain number of games to activate to get the diamond coin and I would have had the diamond coin from the picks right because I was working the motherfucking tournament <laughs> I couldn't do that could I and I didn't know to get some little cunt to log into my account to just watch the game so at the end I was clicking like that's weird why haven't I uh why haven't I got the diamond coin and then it just said that thing like you did not check watching the game and I was like Valve I was working the game. How the fuck? I can't just have a PC next to it. That'd be mad indulgent, wouldn't it? Like, just do the draft. Excuse me a second. Just, uh, what's the IP you get? Like, can I get us an all weird? Gabe Newell, sort your shit. Reach out to me now. You owe me a diamond coin. If I don't get a diamond coin, <laughs> then as far as I'm concerned, you betrayed all of Counter Strike and all of history. And on that note, uh, it's where I'm actually the spot. That's obviously a joke. That was all turning in cheek there. I, yeah, that's also when I realised, by the way, I've actually tested the waters. I know Valve doesn't like totally care about CS because if you don't know, this is real. When they fired fucking Too Good from that event in Shanghai, like it was only like two months later or something, like the MLG Columbus major. And I just kept doing all tweets, basically like, tweeting at Gabe Newell, like telling me he couldn't <laughs> fire me or something. And you know what? I don't think he knows it can't still exist. He didn't give a fuck, you know. <laughs> there was no thread for me. He was just like, whatever, mute. You know, what the like, fuck is this you know, Exactly. <laughs> Counter Strike. I don't even play that game. What are you talking about? Oh, right, that's how we get... Nah, whatever, who gives a fuck? It's not daughter, is it? Oi! This video was kindly supported by Eddie, Chris with a K, Lager15, Pronogo, Shenlong, Zachary Carter, Zach Schmid, Adam Oaks, Alexander Rao, Animosity, Dean Tanglis, Doomseer, Eric Hillestad, Hades, J Dobbs, Jensen Go, John Shelton, Joseph Ginsberg, Kovacevic, Tobias Bernasconi, Zumba, and Xyrothenia. And as always, special thanks go out to my main man, Jerky's Minion. Want to suggest a topic or a guest? Do you want to ask a question in one of those AMAs? Do you want teasers? See who the guests are? Maybe you want to take part and chat with me in one of those esports discussions. Well, for all of the above, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Patreon link in the description box below and become a part of the Skrilluminati.